it's seven. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, and tonight, we are bodhisattvas about to abide in the sixth Bhumi stage. This is from our Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra that we've been going through for several weeks now. And tonight, we are about to have this sixth vision. Uh, and we've been talking about these various visions that the Bodhisattva will have before they abide in these different stages. And I've talked about the stages. We've talked about all of this before. And I want to start tonight with a comment that it's sort of a lingering comment or a lingering idea from last week. And it, it's regarding these visions. And so last week we had this vision of uh, maybe a woman, maybe women, maybe all women. Uh, again, the language like we talked about was not clear, but this woman would have a crown of flowers. Um, we had various visions of a jewel-filled world. We had visions of uh, jeweled lotuses. We had visions of all kinds of different things. And I've been doing my best to you know, give you a lot of different ways to think about these visions. And there's one, there's one way to think of these visions that I don't think I've actually said. And again, it's, this is sort of lingering from last week about our conversation from last week about like, what, what could that mean, you know, for the Bodhisattva to have this vision. And there's this sort of one really obvious uh, interpretation of these visions. And I, I guess what I want to say is, is that it's sort of just, to, again, to lead us into tonight, but it's the idea that maybe, maybe another way to think about these, again, maybe it's the obvious way, is that these are actual sort of like visions that the Bodhisattva will have. And us doing this kind of Jungian interpretation of like, well, what does it mean? And what, you know, what could they be saying? And are, does it mean that the Bodhisattva will see all women as having crowns of flowers? And what does, what does that mean if a Bodhisattva, da, 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 versus this kind of obvious, again, it's sort of this obvious interpretation that the Bodhisattva will actually sort of like, they're describing a vision. <laughs> And, and it's like, it'll look something like a woman with flowers in her hair or something. And it'll look something like a flower, but bejeweled. And it'll look something like, and, and you know, I may have sort of indicated something along those lines that these may be actual visions. And this is the best way to describe what these visions will look like or something like that. But I want to, you know, open you up to an, uh, an additional way of thinking about this that's sort of along those lines of, of what I would refer to as like a, a one-off vision. Like we are not talking about the interpretation of these things. We're actually talking about having like some kind of visionary experience that looks something like these things. And one, th this is something that um, I, I'm drawing from personal experience but I'm using a very made up example. So I don't want anybody to think I'm divulging anything about my path or my experiences. But as an analogy, something that came to my mind last week that I didn't mention was, so this vision of maybe a woman with adornments and a crown of flowers and things like that, when I actually first read the vision, I couldn't help but think of the that Catholic image of the Our Lady of Guadalupe. Our Lady of Guadalupe is a woman. Indeed, it is a vision that somebody had in Mexico, I believe, of the Virgin Mary, but in the sky, a vision, uh, draped in adornments of different sorts and with a crown. And you know the crown sort of has, I believe, stars or something like that or something. But that's not my point. 
and I'm not even talking about the, uh, the Our Lady of Guadalupe or Christ, uh, Christian Catholicism. What I'm talking about is that it, it could be something as, and, and again, I'm just throwing out an interpretation. I don't know. I've been trying to make that clear since we started these visions, this part that I, I don't know but it could be something like imagine that you have been practicing your dharma and you've been going through these various stages and you've actually had some weird experiences where you've seen uh you know um these kind of lotuses or something to that effect and these jewels or something to that effect and these rare flowers scattered everywhere and so you've sort of been having these visions and you you're noticing that you're on the path and then something clicks one day, you know, regarding meditation or something like that. And at that very moment, you come across a postcard of Our, Gua Our Lady of Guadalupe. But it actually is so synchronistic, almost, you know, auspiciously synchronistic that you should see this postcard at this exact same moment. And it's like, wow, that's the woman. That's the woman with the, with the adornments and the crown. And it's not that it's about Our Lady of Guadalupe and, and Catholicism, Christianity. What I'm suggesting is that the lived experiences, the lived experience of these visions out in this world that we live in, where that our world that is just full of symbolism everywhere and full of things going on, one possible way in which this happens is that you see something that you've seen a million times before, but you see it new and it clicks and it's a vision. And that's why I wanted to use that reference of the Our Lady of Guadalupe symbol, because I know you've seen it, but I wanted you to think about how maybe you could see it again, something like that. So, so that's today's starter for these visions is again, maybe these are actual like just visions that occur to the Bodhisattva. Um, on that note of my own personal experience with, with these visions, or at least, you know, my, uh, yeah, my experiences with these visions, I mentioned this at the very, very beginning when we were going through this, uh, meaning by this, I mean the 10 Bumi stages that my experience of these has been something rather like a kind of Sufi spiraling up the mountain where I feel like I've gone through all 10 of these stages in various ways, several times, so to speak. And that these are sort of indicators of change and progress and advancement and cultivation. And I'm not actually saying, by the way, <laughs> that I've had or seen these 10 things, not at all. I made the comment about the Sufi spiraling up the mountain as it pertained to the 10 stages, not these 10 visions. And so what I meant was, was that when you're looking at the way these stages play out in terms of ideas of great joy, ideas of Vimala, this kind of stainless purity, and ideas of, well, or like today, this idea of manifestation um, it's been those stages that I feel like I have coursed through in some way in my practice and my study of the Dharma. And so again, I feel like they are markers or indicators of some sort of progress in that way. So happy to say more about that at some point, if anybody would like. Otherwise, we're going to dive back into the sutra. Um, yeah, let's just dive back in. I think I'll read, I'm going to read the vision, tonight's vision. I'll read from the book. You know, this is one of those visions where there's not a lot of um, uh, dispute, let's say, or whatever about the words. Um, and and they're, they're, this version is a little more uh, well-written. Mine is still a little clunky. I'll tell you a little bit about what I would change. But let's just read it. Uh, here we go. And when a bodhisattva is about to abide in the stage of abhimukhi, uh, what they call direct presence, this stage is also sometimes just translated as manifestation 
or the manifest. So when a bodhisattva is about to abide in this stage of abhimukhi, direct presence, the sixth bhumi stage, they will first have a vision of a beautiful pond filled with pure lucid water having eight merits. Gold sand will form the bottom of the pond and four jeweled flights of steps will be on its sides and the pond will be adorned with blue, red, white, and various colored lotus flowers. And the bodhisattva will see themselves playing in this pond. <laughs> this, so this is, I think, the, the, the wordiest, the wordiest of our visions. We have the most details regarding this vision. And, you know, I'm going to offer, as usual, a bunch of different interpretations of what this might mean and how it pertains to the stages. Um, uh, yeah, the first thing we have to deal with is this sixth Bhumi stage, Abhimukhi. Uh, the text called it direct presence. I have seen other versions or other translations, of course, where this is um, manifestation or the manifest. This, um, it's a really interesting idea. Uh, as usual, I've done my fair amount of research today, trying to find out the exact meaning of this. For those Dharma students in the Dharma doors tonight, the, the prefix of this word, Abhi, we know all about Abhi, Abhidharma, Abhinya, the higher knowledges, or Abhidharma, the higher dharmas. Abhi, you know, Abhi has this sense of higher, you, you might want to translate it in Greek as meta, like you have regular old physics and then you have metaphysics, like higher physics in that way. The idea is, is that this is like Abhi means above, supra, and then Muki. Muki is definitely where I could not figure. Now I know I can figure out what it means. You start looking, doing some Sanskrit etymology. You start putting together how the Chinese translate this. And indeed, Muki has this sense of to come forward is what muki means. Um, and the Chinese sort of, sort of indicates this kind of standing before, coming forward or standing before, but then you, that's muki. You gotta add that this is abhi muki. So this is some sort of like meta standing before, that would be a really kind of like technical wild way to translate this. I'm going to have a lot more to say about what Abhimukhi might mean, but the sense that you should get, I think, from the word, like if you just are going to, going to just understand the word, it's sort of like this idea of presence versus absence, like that which is not here. So yeah, uh, you could think temporally in terms of the past, is not here, the future is not here, but there's even many things that you could think of that are not here. And so the, the present, directly present, the directly manifest, that is this sixth boomy stage. This is the sixth stage of the Bodhisattva that is called direct presence, manifestation in that way. Again, I'll have a lot more to say about that as we go along. The idea, of course, is that the bodhisattva is about to abide in that stage. So we kind of don't even really need to know exactly what that word means because that's where we're headed. We're about to go abhimukhi. <laughs> and so right before we go abhimukhi, we're going to have a vision and that vision has multiple parts to it. 
The first part of it is that the Bodhisattva will see a beautiful flower pond. And this is one place where I would change the translation. Our standard English translation here said that it was a beautiful pond filled with pure lucid water having eight merits. That's where I would not quite agree with this. I would not agree with that both in terms of the grammar, the grammar of the Chinese, and most importantly, it sort of misses the meaning of it. Or at least, you know, it misses a kind of obvious interpretation. Again, I'm not going to say that this is the only interpretation, but it's, it's, it's probably a good one. So it is a beautiful flower pond, but in the Chinese, it actually says that the waters are the eight virtues. Not that the waters like are virtuous. And essentially it's actually, if you read the Chinese correctly in that way, grammatically, you understand, oh, and again, this is just an interpretation. Please don't take this as the, the, the be all, the end all. But within the world of Buddhism, the number eight is reserved for very special teaching. And that's the Eightfold Path. And they are always referred to as the eight virtues, the eight meritous practices, the eight. That's the eight. And so you can begin your interpretation of what, what is this flower pond? What is this beautiful flower pond that the Bodhisattva has a vision of? Well, the waters are of the eight virtues. So the waters are the Eightfold Noble Path. Again, that's an interpretation. Then it says that gold sand will form the bottom of the pond. And I actually have it a little bit different. Um, but it's more or less what it is, is that the vision that you are to have as it is laid out is that you see this beautiful pond. It has these eight waters of the eight virtues and the bottom of the pond is gold sand. I don't really have anything to offer regarding that, the meaning of gold sand. Sand, of course, is a very interesting metaphor in Buddhism. I wouldn't, I wouldn't really go out on a limb and think they're referring to the sands of the Ganges River and all of that. It could be that this is just a descriptor for the beauty and lustrousness of this pond. But again, I, and I'm just kind of laying this out. We're, we're going to come back to all of these. Then we have... Then we have these four jeweled paths. And it's interesting that in the Chinese, you know, they use this word Tao or this word for path. These four jeweled paths that lead down into the golden filled waters. Uh, you could go out on a limb uh, uh, on what that interpretation is of the four paths and the jeweled paths. We can hold off on the four paths for a second, but I, the one thing that I want to kind of mention right now, before we kind of start really diving, diving into this pond, I, I want to kind of share with you um, something that's happened, right? So something that has happened is that we have managed to spend six weeks on basically six sentences. These visions are laid out in essentially a sentence. And there's something kind of interesting about spending an hour and a half on a sentence and taking the time to draw out some as poorly as it is to draw out these sort of visions. And, you know, I didn't intend to do this. <laughs> I said this a long time ago. I thought this sutra would take us two, three weeks tops. 
and here we are weeks and weeks and weeks later. Um, and I'm happy about that. I'm happy about the way the Roots mural turned out when we spent 10 weeks on the 10 Paramitas and we kind of ended with this beautiful mural of all the Roots of Virtue. And I didn't really intend for that to happen. And I was like, oh, that's kind of a beautiful thing that happened. Something else that is beautiful, in my opinion, that has happened is that there is in these visions a kind of an accumulation of metaphors. We've got flowers, we've got jewels, right? And in fact, we have different kinds of flowers that have been, uh, like there were some lotuses, pundaricas, then there were some rare flowers, then we got chumka and all kinds of other flowers. So there are these, theme, these themes that are part of this. And here in this beautiful sixth division, we start to get all the metaphors kind of collapsing in one. And so I'm very happy that I took the time to draw all those jewels and the jewel filled world because it, it sort of, it forced me to really think about these visions, drawing these things forced me to uh, think of these visions and like what exactly is being described, what are the metaphors? And so interesting that these are these four jewel paths, right? And so I would just kind of refer you to the earlier talks about jewels and what kind of is going on with those. And now these four jeweled paths. I mean, in terms of dharmas, it's kind of like take your pick. If it comes in fours, <laughs> you know, it's, it's probably a likely candidate. I would put personally, I would put at the, the top of my list of possibilities, the four right efforts. This idea of of kind of cultivating good dharmas. And if you don't have any good dharmas, trying to produce good karma or dharmas in that sense, and trying to avoid the production of bad karma or dharmas in that sense. And if you have produced bad dharmas, that you try not to cultivate them or let them grow. And those are the four right efforts. They constitute right effort. And I have seen those for spoken of before as a kind of fourfold path unto themselves. But again, that's not to exclude any other teaching that comes in force <laughs> in that way. All right, everybody feeling pretty good about? Yeah, no. Um, just, uh, I mean, I bet you're probably gonna get to this, but you were, in terms of the metaphors all coming together, we have the four direct flowers came from four directions, right? I missed that one. I mean, I meant to, I meant to say okay. it, but yes. Okay. okay. A, a tr tremendous insight of a, an, an additional way in which all the visions start to come together with this one. The flowers, the directionality, the jewels, awesome. Any other insights or comments before we? All right. So we have a vision of this beautiful pond, waters of the eight virtues, four jeweled paths lead to the bottom where there is gold sand. And you can see I've, I've tried to do my best. I, I Perspective is, is a whole other thing, right? That's really what separates <laughs> the real artists from the not real artists. So uh, pardon my perspective, but okay. And then the next part, after the floor four flights of jeweled steps, ah, this is where also I, I'm a little disappointed in that the translation. So inside the pond, so four jeweled paths will lead to golden sand at the bottom. And then it says also inside this pond, are Utpala flowers, Padma flowers, Kumuda flowers, and the Bodhisattva will also see all kinds of Pundarika flowers gloriously adorning the pond. 
So Ut, Utpala, oh, by the way, these are all um, nymph, nymphs, right? The water nymphs, the uh, lotuses, water lotuses, the nymph, I forget the Latin, the nymph, nymphania or the nymphs, right? These are all kinds of lotus flowers. And indeed the Utpala is a blue lotus flower. It's a be beautiful, if you, if you look, I've never seen one in real life, but I have seen the pictures of them and they're a beautiful, beautiful flower. So in this English translation, they just decided to tell you that it would be filled with blue lotus flowers, which is, that's, you know, that's fine because usually Utpala stand for blue flowers. But my whole thing about translating Chinese is that in the Chinese, it says Utpala <laughs> flower. <laughs> So they transliterated the Sanskrit in Chinese. And they, so they didn't decide to call it a blue flower. They called it an Utpala flower. So I would stick with Utpala and let the reader decide or go look up that it's a blue flower. The Padma is a red lotus flower. So that's the idea of the, uh, the red and the blue. Kamuda flowers seem to be a variety of colors, but white seems to be their uh, main color. And of course, those three, the red, the white, and the blue, well, the, that's not an uncommon trinity of colors. Let's just put it that way, right? We live in a country who, or in, at least us in the United States, live in a country whose flag is those primary colors. And there's a lot of depth to the meaning of those colors. In Buddhism, traditionally, you should know that the red lotus flower is kind of usually a symbol of compassion. The blue lotus flower is usually a symbol of wisdom. And the white lotus flower is usually a symbol of kind of uh, purity in that sense. And so those three types of lotus flowers might be referring to those three kinds of uh, virtues or qualities. And the the text does make it a point actually to say that inside the pond there will be these Utpala, Padma, and Kumuda flowers. And then hard stop, new sentence. Oh, and there will also be all kinds of Pundarika flowers adorning everywhere. And the Pundarika is sort of this, mm, at least as far as I've seen, the way I've seen it used, the general term for a lotus. And so there's this, especially the way it's being used in the vision, these are like multicolored, every, you know, everything goes kind of a Pundarika flower everywhere. And, you know, I took the liberty of putting a few in our Bodhisattva's hair there, you know. Um, but the idea is, is that these flowers are adorning this lotus pond. And that word right there, the word adornment, I spent a little, a little bit of time last week on that word adornment. The idea was is that the vision of our lady with flowers in her hair, she was draped in adornments. And I had spoken at some point during this talk about this idea of vyuha. Uh, vyuha is this idea of an arrangement or an adornment. And it's an interesting idea that's used in the Mahayana tradition to describe, well, to describe, at, le at least not in, in this vision in that way, but usually it's used to describe the appearance of bodhisattvas, that they are sort of, they have these adornments, but they're not adornments of jewelry and things like that. They're actually adorned with virtues. And so I, I mentioned last week that there's a way in which uh, bodhisattvas are adorned in truth because they don't speak falsely. They avoid malicious speech, harsh speech, divisive speech. They speak kindly. And so there's a way in which they are adorned with kind speech. And I know that, you know, in a, you know, a visual heavy culture like ours, where we're accustomed to thinking of adornments as like jewelry, the idea that somebody could be adorned with truthful speech, that, that might seem a little like, 
weird, but it's it's a way of thinking that you could kind of uh, try on, right? If I could mix metaphors there a little bit, so. Um, and so the only reason I go down that adornment road is to remind you that that's it's an additional part of these visions that has returned, these adornments. And so we are to understand that this pond is adorned with all these pundarika flowers, but maybe these pundarika flowers are not normal pundarika flowers, right? That's That would be the idea of using that that keyword adornment. All right. And the fifth, the last, or sorry, the last, the last part of, I don't know why I said fifth, maybe there was a, my notes are maybe in fifth, but anyways, the last part of the vision. It's, it's my favorite part of this vision. When I read this the first time, I got such delight from this that, the Bodhisattva will have a vision of this beautiful pond with water, waters of the eight virtues with these four jewels paths leading to the gold sand and there'll be all this beautiful flowers inside the pond. And they will see themselves playing inside that pond. Right. So, you know, I did the, again, I did the best I could to display our lovely, can you imagine our lovely Akshayamati Bodhisattva who's been enduring this endless Dharma talk for weeks and weeks and weeks. And now he's like getting to play in this lotus pond, right? <laughs> okay, so that's the vision and those are the elements of it. And that's more or less sort of a breakdown of what those things might mean. But now I wanna return us all the way back to this idea of Abhimukhi that this is a vision that, that a bodhisattva will have right before they abide in this sixth bhumi, this sixth bodhisattva stage. And this stage is, has this really weird kind of name. And you know, I say weird because it's like, if you go looking in the dictionaries, this is not a word that pops up all the time. This abhimukhi, right? And I want to, I think there's a two, few different ways I've thought about um, approaching this. And I think I want to read, yeah, let me read, because this is, yeah, if I don't get to, I have a bunch of other things, but if I don't get to the other things, that's kind of whatever, but let's get to this. So I'm going to read a little bit from the Avatamsaka Sutra. This is the chapter of the large Avatamsaka Sutra. This is the chapter that is the chapter on the 10 stages, right? The Dasa Bhumi Sutra. Um, this is chapter 26 of the Avatamsaka Sutra. And, you know, I met, I've mentioned this sutra before that if you have been, uh, if, if this, Sutra, the Akshayamati Sutra, has piqued your interest in these 10 stages, then you might want to read the 10 stages sutra. You don't need to read the whole Avatamsaka Sutra. You don't. This little, ten, I mean, it's 100 pages, so it's not that little, but this sutra, it, it existed all on its own for a long time and still sometimes does, so it is a standalone sutra if you, if you would like it to be. Um, and so I'm going to be reading from that. And, you know, it's always difficult to, it's always difficult to read from the Avatamsaka Sutra because it's so, um, it's, kind of, it's vast and it has vast ideas, vast, long sentences. Um, I, I may have mentioned at some point, it doesn't really lend itself to Hallmark card pithy quotes by the Buddha, because <laughs> it, it, it's, it's the beauty is in these really long, wild sentences. And so, but I found one, I found one that I think really fits nicely. This is, um, yeah, so I'm just, I don't need to tell you much about where it falls into it. 
it's the description about this sixth stage. And I actually think it will really help give you uh, a feel for this vision. Um, and so the Bodhisattva, who is a star player of this sutra, um, so it's actually not the Buddha, but a Bodhisattva who tells us, the readers, those who have thoroughly fulfilled the path of the fifth stage of bodhisattvas enter into the sixth stage of bodhisattvas. They enter the sixth stage by way of 10 qualities. They enter by way of the equality of the signlessness of all things. They enter by the equality of the birthlessness or non-origination of all things. They enter by the equality of absence of characteristic marks of all things. They enter by the equality of the non-birth of all things. They enter by the equality of detachment of all things. They enter by the equality of the primordial purity of all things. They enter by the equality of the non-conceptuality of all things. They enter by the equality of all things in neither coming nor going. They enter by the equality of all things in being like illusions, like dreams, reflections, echoes, or the moon's image in a drop of water. And they enter by the equality of the non-duality of existence and non-existence of all things. Thus, observing all things in terms of their intrinsic nature and according with it, without opposition, they attain the sixth stage of bodhisattvas, the stage of presence, abhimukhi. Okay. So those were the 10, at least according to the 10 stages sutra, these 10 equalities that a bodhisattva sort of comes to an understanding of these equalities and by coming to an understanding of these 10 equalities of all things, they enter and abide in this abhimukhi, this sixth stage. And so this is, this is really where it starts to get uh, heavy. <laughs> so we got these 10 visions that we're working on and we've just done this vision. And I've told you that this vision of the Bodhisattva playing in a lotus pond, this vision corresponds to this sixth Bhumi stage. But I've mentioned in the past that each of these 10 Bhumi stages also correspond to one of the paramitas, the 10 perfections. And so if you know your paramitas, which I know you do, the sixth paramita is the paramita of pranya, transcendent wisdom, pranya paramita. And the way that I described the relationship between the paramitas and the stages was this kind of analogy of looking at the paramitas and the stages as being like rungs of a ladder. And depending on one's relationship to that rung, one is either below it and is using that rung to pull oneself up or one's up and is using that rung to stand on. And so that's kind of a Buddhist dependent origination thing where depending on where you stand in relationship to this rung, it is either something you use to pull yourself up or it's something you use to stand on. And so the idea is, is that one uses pranya or exercises pranya or practices or cultivates or observes pranya 
And in the cultivation of that transcendent wisdom, one comes to this understanding of abhimuki, of this presence of the sixth stage. And before all that happens, you'll see this. <laughs> so a lot, a lot going on here. We've got paramitas, we've got boomies, we've got visions, we got lotus flowers. So a lot going on. So if anybody's lost about how all this fits together, please feel free to stop me. Are they doing okay? Cool. So since we have lots of time, I want to, or I would like to actually, kind of walk us through those 10 equalities that were described and just start to feel our way towards this presence or direct presence or manifestation, this abhimuki, right? And, you know, the first thing that I want to emphasize, yeah, the first thing that I want to emphasize about these 10 is that these are actually called, these are these 10 equalities or the full language of the text are these 10 equalities of all things. And so that, that view of the world, and not just the view of the world, but the view of all these things, right? All these things in the world, um, you know, uh, windows, got books, got socks, you know, all kinds of things, you know, it goes on and on. And so the idea is, is that there is this really um, important dharma called equanimity in Buddhism, this idea of upeksha, this idea of being equanimous. That, of course, is a key Buddhist thing. That's, that's always key to Buddhism equality. And in particular, this equality towards all things. What do we mean by equality towards all things? Well, it's deep. It's deep. It's going to get really deep in a second when we start talking about the non-origination of things. But before we talk about the non-origination of all things, <laughs> there's just a way in which you can think of equality and what they're talking about is a kind of a way in which we value and judge all the things of this world. We value and judge the people in this world, the stuff in this world, everything in this world, actually. We are sort of in the, in the habit, uh, the bad mental habit in a way, of judging and evaluating everything, putting things in, into boxes, favoring things and saying useful, not useful, beautiful, ugly, all of these different ideas about things. Equanimity or equality is truly a disposition towards all phenomena that is sort of this equal disposition towards all phenomena. This level-hearted, relationship towards all phenomena. That's equanimity. And these are going to, these are, we're going to talk, depending on how much time we have, but we're going to talk about these 10 ways in which all phenomena are equal. So we're going to break it down about like how it is that all phenomena or all things or all concepts or all everything in that way how it's all kind of equal. But before we do that, I want to say something about equality that I, I might not have said, or I might not have said it recently. There is one way of thinking of equality, this equanimity, this upeksha. I've heard it described one way. And that one way is sort of this very kind of muted, muted equal disposition towards all things, where nothing gets me very excited, but nothing gets, bothers me either. 
So no ups, no downs, e equal, equanimous. I have heard of upeksha and equanimity described as that. No ups, no downs, equanimous. And I think that there's a way in which, in terms of a certain kind of um, emotional self, that, that might be a good thing to think about. Absolutely. However, I want to relay to you a, a different way of describing upeksha, a different way of thinking of equanimity that I think gets to exactly the same point, if you will, but it's sort of a different interpretation and it's one that I agree much more with. So this interpretation of equanimity is, a, I get it from the Vietnamese Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, I always am getting most of the, if you've heard it from me and you, it's been impressive, it probably came from Thich Nhat Hanh. It's probably what I have to say. But Thich Nhat Hanh describes equanimity this way. And he, and he, by the way, he recognizes that other way I described. And he's also not a huge fan of that kind of bland, muted equanimity. The way he describes equanimity is, oh, he says, it's like a parent that has a bunch of children. It would be a bad parent that favored this one as beautiful, or this one as the smart one, or this one as the whatever one and treated some of their other kids as the ugly one, the stupid one, or whatever. Thich Nhat Hanh says equanimity is about the parent that loves all their children equally for who they are and doesn't favor that smart one over the not so smart one, but actually recognizes each one for who they are, but loves them. And that's the key. It's not this muted relationship towards each of them. And that's what makes it equanimous. The equanimity is about the not withholding the love or not withholding anything from this or from that and just giving it here. Equanimity is about this real, you know, equanimity in that way. But it's very generous, it's very joyful and very loving is what I want to say. So, everybody okay with that, def moving forward with that definition of equanimity? Cool. Okay, so that's the kind of equanimity that we're trying to reach. By the way, when we reach this level of equanimity towards all phenomena, it might feel like dancing in a jeweled lotus pond. So this is what I mean. This is not about being like muted towards reality. But the idea here is, is that the way in which one can splash around in this lotus pond of manifestation, one way is by noting, by being aware of these 10 kind, these 10 equalities of all things, right? And the first one is this, the equality of the signlessness of all things. Well, this is one of my favorite ideas in Mahayana Buddhism. It's this idea of the um, animita or alakshana, um, having no characteristics, no lakshana. And of course, you know, the language here is about this signlessness of all phenomena. And we've talked about this before, and I don't want to belabor each one of these, but I just want to remind you that what these lakshana are, of course, are these characteristics and qualities by which I, by which I know that I'm looking at, I don't know, a clock versus a water bottle. The reason why you think this is a clock and this is a water bottle is this has the characteristics of a clock. It looks like a clock. If you were here, you could hear the little tick, tick, tick. So it sounds like a clock. This looks like a water bottle. It tastes like a water bottle. So it has all the lakshana of a water bottle. So now this idea of lakshana characteristics, it's, it's the things that make things things. 
Those are the signs. Those are the marks. Those are the lakshana. But an aspect of pranya, and remember this whole night tonight, the vision, the stage, all is about pranya wisdom. The wisdom of a bodhisattva, the wisdom of pranya is actually, as crazy as this sounds, it's understanding that the characteristics by which I recognize things and the characteristics that I think things have, they don't actually have those characteristics. And as I've, I've often used like color as the premier example of this, I think this is a red clock and that the redness is a characteristic or a quality that is owned or possessed or held by, by this, right? But of course, physics and general phenomenology will show me, oh no, that particular red, the particular red that I'm seeing is actually arising dependent upon the rods and cones in my eye and dependent upon a bunch of interpretation and kind of uh, understanding of information that then turns into this image of a red clock. And I mistake that dependently originated redness for being over here. When really it's not over here, it's a dependently originated phenomena. And in fact, you can go down the pranya rabbit hole and begin to realize that each and every phenom each and every characteristic by which I understand phenomena is actually dependently originated over here. And actually any given phenomena doesn't have any characteristics or qualities. In other words, it all phenomena is signless. But all phenomena are equally signless, meaning my water bottle and my clock both don't have any signs. That's how it is that they're both equal. And so in, indeed, what this teaching right now is saying is indeed beauty is in the eye of the beholder in many, many more ways than one. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not just about the judgment of beauty. That which I even think is beautiful is in the eye of the beholder. So that little realization of how it is that the, the color of something is, or the sound or whatever it is, it's not actually out there. It's a dependently originated phenomena based just as much on my app, on the organs, on the sensory apparatus. And when, when the Bodhisattva realizes that, oh, oh, that is called the signlessness of all things. And if you understand that about the signlessness of all things and understand that Oh, the beauty and the ugly is just up here. It's not out there. Valuable, not valuable. Oh yeah, that's all up here. When the Bodhisattva realizes that all of these characteristics and qualities that I was favoring or not favoring, when the Bodhisattva realizes they are dependently originated here, there's this potential for understanding, oh, then anything I'm looking at, oddly is just like everything else I'm looking at in that everything doesn't have these signs. <laughs> Everything's signless. And that levels the playing field of phenomenal reality. And if, it, and if you're thinking about it the right way, it, it generates a sense of equanimity towards things Tr by default. You don't even have to try. <laughs> it's actually the beauty of pranya is that if you really, really kind of recognize this, you, you don't have to try to be equanimous. You, you, it just, again, it happens by default in that way. Everybody good with just that quick lesson on signless, the equality of the signlessness of all things. 
And so I want to go through a few of these, uh, you know, I don't want to belabor any one of them, but I want to go through to just start giving you a feel for what might this you know, and you might already be there. You might be like, oh, I get it, I get it, I get it. And that's great. Um, but, you know, just for fun then, just for fun. Uh, so the first one is uh, entering, entering this sixth boomy stage by the equality of the signlessness of all things, entering by the equality of the non-origination of all things. This is this really beautiful idea, this, um, uh, Anupata, Anupatika, which is not Sam, Samudpatika, co-arising, not the co-arising, the Anupatika, no arising. And this is a really interesting idea. So this idea of arising is also what we would call birth, coming into being or coming into existence. And the bodhisattva practicing pranya comes to this understanding that all these things that we were just talking about, all these things that we just realized, oh, they don't have those characteristics and qualities I thought they had. Huh. Yeah. So all those things, the bodhisattva also comes to an understanding that they are non-originated non-produced, not birthed. And the classic example I, I like to use to demonstrate the birthlessness of phenomena is a fist. And you might, you know, you might be wondering yourself, hey, where'd that fist come from? Hey, wait a minute, where'd it come from? And so behold, a phenomena that, and look, here it is, manifest, right? Right in front of you, right? And the idea is, where did it come from? Where was it born? Or from, from, from where? From what was it born? What, like, where did it come from? Or better yet, where to go? Where to go? Oh, it's bad. <laughs> and so that little funny game with the fist. The fist is a phenomena. It's a, it like, you know, it's here. But if you're thinking, where did it come from? Or where did it, where did it go? Those aren't really the right questions to be asking about this. Right? It's, it's here because the conditions you could say are are being met <laughs> for it to be here if you will and what i the reason why i like the fist is how easily it comes in and out of existence and it can really demonstrate how something can be without having come from anywhere and without going anywhere and now, if you understand that about the fist, the pranya realization is that all phenomena are like a fist. All phenomena are insofar as they are, but don't come from anywhere and don't go anywhere. In the same way that my fist didn't come from anywhere and didn't go from anywhere. And of course, just if, 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 if you're a little confused, let me just help you out on that real quick. The idea is, is that, oh, the clock, right? The red, the red clock, right? The idea is, is that if, if you think that this is an, an object in my hand, then there is the idea of its manufacture date the, the day before it existed, and then it was manufactured, and now it exists, and it will keep existing until it falls apart, and then there won't be any clock. But from the date of manufacture until the date of destruction, there was a clock. What this teaching is about 
is about how that clock idea, that's an idea in your head like, uh, I don't know, like fist. And so you can see a form. You can see a, a, a shape in, in, re, in nature that meets your criteria for what a fist is. And lo and behold, you'll see a fist. And now you have some criteria for a clock and lo and behold, this meets the criteria. And so there's a clock in Michael's hand. There's a clock in Michael's fist. What's going on, right? I'm, I'm joking, but the idea here is, is that the, <laughs> What I'm, what I'm saying and what I mean by that is this comment or this realization about the non-origination of things, it's not so much about this as it is about that idea of a clock that you have in your head. That idea of the clock is again, just like that idea of a fist, it's an idea and you can go around and apply that idea to some phenomena you're experiencing, but that doesn't actually make it a real clock or a real fist. It makes it a real phenomena that you're calling a clock or that you're calling a fist. If you get that, that's a window or a peek into the birthlessness or non-origination of all phenomena that all phenomena is actually a label of an idea that the mind can go around and put on everything. But that doesn't make those things real entities in that way. They make them real concepts. And so that's this non-origination of all things. And again, it's a further, a further way in which you can see all things, all phenomena as having the same nature. We'll use that language for now. It's not perfect language, but we'll use it for now because that's what we're talking about is like this equanimous view of reality. It's this view of, oh, wow, all of this stuff, they're all ideas. And what's weird about ideas, of course, is that no idea is bigger than another idea. No idea is more here than there. They're all kind of equally ideas, right? And that's how it is that this view of the non-origination of things can lead to this kind of a realization of the equality of all things. Everybody doing good with that? Let's take a look at another one. So time is, is sort of slipping by, so I'm not gonna do all of these. I'm going to jump down. So one of them, for example, so one of them that might've caught your eye, it was that the Bodhisattva enters this sixth stage by this equality of the primordial purity of all things. And, you know, that sort of speaks, you know, purity, I've done Dharma talks about the prop, the delicate language of purity and impurity of Buddhism, in Buddhism, very delicate, tricky language. Um, I wanted to, here though, I wanted to pause on it because the idea here regarding this, it has a lot to do with this, um, um, judging, but this kind of view of reality that I was describing where we put things in boxes and in particular, we value things over other things in that way. And one particular value system that we have is this kind of like, you know, you, you can think in terms of like, uh, clean and dirty, pure and impure, but it's any kind of like anything from like icky to gross to um, uh, it's a lot of different things that can fit into this polarity or this dualism. 
So when it talks about pure and impure, I just want you to know that it is sort of like, there's a lot going on with that language in many, many ways. And it goes, you know, well, you know, you could, you could look at it as simple as having clean hands or dirty hands. And it's that idea of that judgment of pure and impure that's going to put one in a polarized dualistic place that will be not equanimous. It will not be upekshik towards all phenomena. In fact, you will avoid the impure and gravitates towards the pure in that way. And what's kind of interesting about this one, this primordial purity of all things, you know, the early project of Buddhism was about what's called the Visuddhimagga the path of purification. And the language of that text, which is not a sutra, of course, it's a, it's a commentary, but you know, it's a very old, revered Theravadan Pali Buddhist text. And that language of the path of purification, it's because early Buddhism, they view the individual as being impure, defiled by greed, anger, and delusion. And so the path of purification is about extracting the poisons, the three poisons, greed, anger, and delusion. It, the original path was about extracting those to arrive at a purified place. What's interesting, of course, from the Bodhisattva point of view is that it is that kind of thinking, the pure and impure, oh, this is pure, that's impure. That's what's keeping one in an impure place. And so it's such an interesting, uh, the Mahayana, again, it's such an interesting twist on classic Buddhism that way, where it, it I don't know. So I just wanted to point that out, that early Buddhism sort of did have a purity, impurity thing going on. And it was definitely about mute, moving from an impure state to a pure state. This is much more about, well, realizing the primordial purity of all things in that way. And in many ways, I, you know, this has, this has gone in a very interesting direction that I didn't think it would go. But what I was saying about the signless and the birthless, how it is that if you really get that, equanimity just kind of comes naturally in that way. Similarly, if you really kind of understand the birthlessness, signlessness of all things, there's a way in which this primordial purity is revealed. But I, again, I would refer to you to that Thich Nhat Hanh example of the parent with many children. And it's the vision, the vision of the equanimous parent who sees all their children as primordially pure, right? It's, it's kind of a weird parent that somehow sees their children as somehow innately flawed in that sense. And especially the parent that sees just a couple of their kids innately flawed, right? And having that kind of a thing going on. So I wanna, if, if you, if you have reactions to the language of purity and impurity, which you should, <laughs> you, which you should. So if you have reactions to that though, I don't want you to run away from the Mahayana because they really are on top of that. And so it's just sort of a funny language game where they will do the thing where they'll talk about a primordial purity that comes from transcending ideas of purity and impurity. Yeah. Everybody feeling okay with uh, this couple of these equalities? Yeah. And, and remember, we're, this is the sixth stage. This is, we're deep. We're deep into the Bodhisattva practice here. So, you know. Michael, I've got a quick question. Is awesome. that okay? That is totally okay. Um, going back a little bit, I you you said it, and 
it kind of stuck in my mind, but it's a little bit off this track. Um, you used a couple of times the, the, the term transcendent wisdom. And um, I'm wondering, you know, the modifier, the transcendent, what wisdom is wisdom and what's transcendent wisdom? Why do you use that word? Um, and it, that may be a big question. I don't know, but I'm wondering how you're, you're using it. That's it? That's it. Okay. Um, I'll tell you, um, I'm, 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 I love segues. So that's like the perfect segue. I'm going to answer the question, Dean. Don't worry. Take your time. So I'll make this the last equality uh, of the, from the, from the 10 stages sutra that I'll read. So this is the Bodhisattva that enters this sixth stage by the equality of all things being like illusions, dreams, reflections, echoes, the moon's image in a drop of water or apparitions. So the Bodhisattva has this pranya, the, the transcendent wisdom by understanding that all phenomena, all these things that we were talking about, that we think have qualities, but don't, that we think come from places, but don't, that we think might be pure or impure, but aren't. <laughs> this one is that the Bodhisattva enters this way of understanding by the equality of all things being like a hallucination, illusions, like a dream, like a shadow or a reflection, as like echoes, the moon's image in a drop of water, or like an apparition, meaning a ghost. So when it says that the Bodhisattva views all phenomena as being like that, they're of course one of the ones that I, 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 I reference this one a lot. It's the viewing all phenomena as being dreamlike. That's what it says. It says the Bodhisattva, and this is straight out of the Vajra, right? The Vajra Sutra, the Pranya Paramita, the Vajra Chetika Pranya Paramita Sutra. Last chapter, chapter 32, the Buddha says, all conditioned phenomena, all things, the Bodhisattva should see them as like dreams, like illusions, like shadows and like bubbles. In other words, let's say you have a dream some night. And in that dream, you see a clock. Looks just like this clock, right? And then you wake up. And you say, wow, that was a really weird dream. I saw Michael's clock. I saw that clock that Michael was waving around. I saw it in my dream, right? So that clock, the one that you saw in your dream, and this one, the same. Now, wait a minute, Michael. This is via virtual reality and Zoom. So of course that one I saw in my dream and the one you just showed me are the similar because I've never touched the one that you showed me, didn't touch the one in the dream. They're both, I've never really dealt with the real one. I've only dealt with the idea one. You're right. So you really need to take it that step further. And, and I encourage you to actually take this step further. We are talking about, like for, my, for me, Michael, my example, it's about me, and I'm holding this, this clock right now. It's about me reflecting on a dream I might have. Maybe I have a dream tonight in which I see the clock. Dharma, the, the Buddha here is saying that that clock that I saw in my dream and this one that I'm holding in my very hand right now the teaching is, is that they are the same. They have the same nature. In fact, they are the, basically the same clock in that regard. And if you were following what I was saying regarding phenomenalism, 
regarding these characteristics that they're not really out there. They're actually a dependently originated kind of emergent property of your own senses in that way. And therefore, even the, even, even this one that I'm like, think that I'm engaging with is a phenomenal one. And in that way, no different than the one I might encounter in a dream. This one, interestingly, just has a, a few more fancy characteristics to it. And one of those characteristics is that it appears to be real. I, that's just a little fun one. That's just a little fun parenthetical pranya, okay? The point is though, and I think you're following me that the idea is, is that if you understand the signlessness and birthlessness and basic phenomenology that we're describing, and then you understand, oh, all of this stuff is a language game and therefore these kind of concepts and ideas and therefore concepts and ideas in a dream, concepts and ideas in here, equally concepts and ideas. That is sort of the beginning of this vision that the Bodhisattva, not this kind of vision, but the, the wisdom that a Bodhisattva has regarding all phenomena. All phenomena is like, it's like a dream clock and like a dream socks and like all of that. However, there's one really wild thing that has to happen here. And that is the Bodhisattva coming to a realization of the dreamlike nature of themselves. And that mind that understand that the, the Michael here, the flesh, the flesh Michael here, that comes to that realization that the flesh Michael is actually a dreamlike phenomenalism, that is approximating the transcendent wisdom of which we speak. And it's transcendent, Dean, because it's not diluted into thinking it's between the ears and behind the eyes, experiencing a reality out there. Pranya understands that there is an experience of dependently originated reality that includes the observer in a kind of feedback loop of reality. Kind of, sort of. Okay, so so we're uh, there. Transcending is is um, it's taking into account the the oh boy, jeez, um, the the it, it, it it's the nature of us. We're actually. Um, Oh God, I'm sorry. I'm just totally stuttering through this. Okay, dreamlike is the idea. And when we understand it's dreamlike, then we're sort of like thinking um, outside ourselves. or is this, I, I'm gonna stop because I'm completely garbling this. No, no, Dean, you're right on it. You're right on it. Think of it like this though. So if you can really, really, um, really get the fist idea mm -hmm. and like, it's a subtle idea, right? But it's like, I'm showing you, it's, it's like in and out. And if you understand that idea of like, oh, that's right, fist is a word that I was taught and I see the thing that fits the label and I can apply the single word fist, but where it gets weird is where, when I forget that I've done that, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I kind of reify the thing and then all of a sudden the thing is flashing in and out of existence and I'm like, no, you can't do that, you're a thing. But then you realize, oh no, that's right, it's a word. It, it could do that all day if it wants, right? Mm -hmm. What we're talking about here is the word Dean, 
that's a word kind of like fist or clock. Mm -hmm. And we apply that word to what we conceive of as a, a single entity, but that's not true in that way. And so the transcendent part would be a mind that it does not identify as Dean, doesn't even identify as human for the most part. And in fact, is not identifying, is liberated, is freed from identification that mind is pranya, is transcendent wisdom. Okay, so it, when it, it turns to transcendent when you get the realization that you're not really, you, that, that you're sort of a dreamlike thing, you yourself, and yet you, you know, you sit with that, you, well, but <laughs> I, I get it, I get it, good, good, okay. <laughs> I'm getting it. I'm getting it. Nice. Yes. Nice. I feel it, Dean. Step closer every, every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Um, the, the Bodhisattva in the pool. Yeah. Akshayamati. Yeah. What was Akshayamati? Okay. Was, was there, a, was there a self in the other visions? Which ones had selves in them? All of them? The one of the armor. The armor, that's the only one I could remember. That was the only one that I think was self-reflexive where yeah. they would have a vision of themselves doing X, Y, or Z. I'm just wondering about the significance of that since this is manifesting and it and you you were just talking about, you know, prania wisdom having to do with the understanding of Everything, hmm. including the self, is signless and birthless and non-originated. Just no, that yeah, that's that's interesting. That's interesting. Um, on that note, though, no, do keep in mind this is right before right. the Bodhisattva abides in this stage, and I say that only because, you know, like the one with the armor and the cudgel and uh, defeating the enemies, that vision that the Bodhisattva has, that vision is right before they achieve this stage of total fearlessness, total peace, uh, kashanti. And it's sort of like an interesting thing that right before they reach the stage of basically not needing armor, not needing a cudgel, not having any enemies, right before that they have this vision. And so interesting, knowing that right before they have a vision of what, like with Dean, we're talking about this idea of utter selflessness. Right. Right before that, they have a vision of themselves playing in this pool of eight virtuous waters. Interesting interpretation. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the playing in the pool seems like it connects very directly to the, what you were reading from the other sutra about the signless, you know, the, the, the equanimity with which if, if you have a truly equanimous view of the world, then everything is a pool for frolicking in, right? In a way, you know, but then, and then how, how does that, and then the next step is direct presence. I don't know, I felt like I understood it better earlier than I do now, like how that is, but. Um, the main reason why I wanted to read the 10 equalities of all things from the 10 stages sutra. The reason why I wanted to read that is definitely to introduce this essential idea of equanimity pertaining to all things, but there's one, there's one really interesting uh, type of equanimity that I want to talk about. I kind of want to finish out this uh, tonight by talking about this one type of equanimity that I, for, for me, it really drives home the idea of abhimukhi, this idea of manifest or direct presence. And what it is, is, is that, it, you know, if you've, you know, I've been trying my best to, to, to um, layer this Dharma talk right? Saying a lot of different things in that way. And if you were have followed what I've been kind of saying about the fist, and that in particular, this idea of, oh, look, 
it didn't come from anywhere and it didn't go anywhere. And I made a joke at some point of like, oh, look, there it is manifested again. Here it is manifest. Here it is present. And I keep mentioning that idea of like, well, it's present. And now it's not, right? What I'm getting at is the one special type of equality that I want to talk about is the one regarding past, present, and future, and how it is actually that seeing something as being in the past and seeing something as being in the future, or even seeing something as being present, is an, an interesting type of non equality. And if you've, been, again, been following what I've been saying regarding the fist, the nature of the fist and all of that, you can kind of start to see how it is that, well, if everything is sort of dreamlike in that way, you can start to see how the past is an interesting well, I don't even want to use the word present. I was I was about to say it's an it's you can start to see how the past is an interesting quality of the present. But the present is an an interesting quality to this experience. Putting it in terms of presence versus being in the past versus being in the future. My point is is that if you've been following what I was saying about the fist and all of that, it this view of reality that sees all phenomena as being like the fist, not coming from anywhere, not going anywhere, but when, when they be, they be. And that is all there is. There is no before, there is no after, there is just this sort of eternal now, as the saying goes or the expression goes, but that view of things as being that the, oh, there, all there is is presence. All there is is, oh, I can't even call it now because now is relative to before and after. So I, I, need, some new, I need some new language, Buddha. How about abhimukhi, right? Like not even present in that way, but this sort of idea of manifest like a fist in that way. So that's definitely my personal read on the playing in the pool of manifestation. It's this incredible liberation that a Bodhisattva experiences in being in present. <laughs> and as I've said before, in many of my Dharma talks, back there, that's regrets. <laughs> and this is anxiety of the future. And if, there's, if, you're, if you're done with the future for a minute, anxiety about the future can fade away a little bit. And if you're done with the past as an idea, then regrets gone. And so there's this liberation in truly being present and it can eventually feel like this kind of playfulness in that way. So um, one last idea, cause I'm just never gonna probably get this opportunity again, just for everybody that like for the Dharma heads, for the Dharma heads, for the Sutra heads, I want to remind you, and I don't think I have a, well, it's not a good picture of it. So this is Amitabha Buddha's Pure Land. And that's actually a lotus pond right here. And that lotus pond that is the center of a pure land. Like if you read the Pure Land Sutra of Amitabha Buddha, they describe a lotus pond at the bottom of four flights of stairs. And it's obviously jeweled and all of that. I want you to kind of recognize the Pure Land theme that goes on with this one. And the reason why I mention that is that having gone through this process, having read these visions, and, and, and particularly this one, this has given me a much greater appreciation for Pure Land Sutras and Pure Land Buddhism in that way. That in, in other words, like if this is interesting to you, like this one, uh, three sentences, three sentence vision, there's whole sutras about this lotus pond is, is, is what I'm saying. <laughs> 
All right. That's it. I'm done. Thanks, everybody, so much.